How's everybody doing? I really appreciate you guys coming out this early to hear me talk because I, I know what it's like to go to a conference and I think about that early session and be like, oh, an extra hour of sleep could be nice. I'll still get to see EUs, but I promise I'll make it worth your while, hopefully. But uh, being a coach, I'm very much, uh, I very much have a style of discussion uh, with my lectures and talks and whichever. So if you guys just have any questions and just want to shoot an arm up or just get involved and make this more of a, a discussion almost, I'm all for it. I won't take you as being rude for, for asking a question within the session. So uh, um, by all means, do that. And I'll probably be picking on a few of you guys just to, to kind of get a feel for who y'all are and what y'all know, which will help me out as far as this talk is concerned. Um, does this sound okay? Am I too loud? Good? Uh, when Mike, it, last fall, when Mike approached, or when Mike talked to me, uh, basically just about the event, um, I wasn't necessarily in line to be a speaker at that point. He was just reaching out to me because I was on the advisory board for the Texas State Clinic, or the NSCA Texas State Division, if you will. And uh, he just reached out to me and asked me, you know, if I had any ideas for, for topics. And uh, being that I'm in the field of strength conditioning, uh, currently at the college level, he just thought that I might have some more ideas of maybe just what's kind of in the trenches, what's in the real world, uh, what are some, some uh, current issues that just need to be addressed for you guys and for just anybody that's trying to learn. And I, I, I jumped on the opportunity, I sent him an email, probably like 10 pages long of just tons of ideas that I had. But one idea was posture and just body position and just understanding the importance of position. And I, you know, I, I went off on, on that email, probably much more than he expected to, to read, uh, but it ultimately led to him asking me to, to lead the talk. So at that point, it's like, oh, crap, what did I do? You know, now I'm, now I'm the guy that's supposed to be the expert to talk about this, and by no means am I some kind of postural guru, you know, I'm no kind of postural expert, uh, but I guess my credibility does come from being a Division I strength coach and dealing with this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis and doing my absolute best to uh, implement better postural means in regards to sport. So I've read the books, I've been to the conferences, I've asked the questions, uh, I've saved a lot of time for you guys to present you with the information that I feel is most vital. So that I guess would be the shortcut as far as what makes me qualified to talk about this subject, if that makes sense. Uh, so that's kind of my little intro. Uh, give you a little bit of background about myself. That's my beautiful wife in the middle, my stepdaughter on the left, and my son on the right. I say that's my stepdaughter because I came into the relationship with the dachshund already being, being part of it. So I gave my wife a hard time and I, I begged her for a real dog one day. And uh, we finally got one about three weeks ago. So uh, I'll actually use him as some illustrations uh, later on, but his name is Jack. Uh, as far as my career is concerned, uh, I am a strength coach. You can tell by the almost bald head. So I'm sure you guys got that right away. I've only been full time for about two and a half years. Before that, I was a grad assistant, and I've always been at AM Corpus Christi. I've been there this whole time, did my undergrad there, my graduate degree there. And it's, there's pros and cons to that. The pros are, you know, I am invested in that program, and I, and I see a lot of the changes, and I can implement a lot of them. The con would be that I'm only at one place. So I, I really understand the importance of visiting other institutions and talking to other coaches like you guys and seeing what other people are doing um, because I don't have all the answers and being in my own little box is not, not healthy for me. So I would implore all of you to reach out to each other, go visit other gyms, uh, even at the college level. Uh, there tends to kind of be this elitist mentality sometimes with some collegiate strength coaches like we do it right so I'm not gonna mess with how, how anyone else does it. Would you be surprised how much you learn just by watching somebody else do what you're trying to do? Like it's, uh, it's always enlightening, I think. So that's my little plug-in for that. Family, obviously really important for me. We have dogs for kids, no kids yet, so uh, that's that. Um, my wife's a nurse on campus. We're about a parking lot away from each other, which makes it really nice. And uh, needless to say, we're really happy being at Corpus. Uh, my faith, my plug-in for that would be, you know, kind of like with this topic, I'm discussing posture and, and better quality movement because I care about my athletes. And I would hope that's why you guys are here also. 
why in the world would I care to have my athlete move better and, and live longer or be healthier throughout their four years with me if I didn't actually care about them? And three years ago, I, I'll be honest, I cared more about myself than them and that it was all about my career and I was always investing in, in me and how I looked and the results that I put out through my athletes. I didn't really give a time of day as far as like their personal feelings and their, uh, their careers and their future. Um, but you know, my personal relationship with Jesus Christ absolutely affected that and now I, I kind of hit that transition where it's more rewarding for me to just invest in these kids uh, as a whole individual rather than just getting some results out of them. So, uh, that's like my little plug-in for that as well. And then, of course, posture. Uh, one definition that I'll give you guys, and hopefully you're taking some notes and whatnot and following the handout, uh, but really posture is just movement integrity. Movement integrity. So in regards to, to movement, uh, posture is a state or condition, which I'll show a slide on that in a second, but it's really the integrity of the movement. So if any of you guys value, guys and girls and value integrity, just you know, from a character standpoint, then you'll understand integrity really carries over in the same definition to movement. We want to have the best and utmost integrity with our character as well as our, as our movement, right? our posture. So here's where I'm going to do a little plug-in for my little son there, Jack. Um, he's four months old. We found him uh, at my wife's parents' lake house. And uh, you know, I've been begging my wife for, for uh, I guess, years now. Uh, for a dog, and the funny thing is, she was smitten by him. She saw him, it's like, we have to take him home, and I was, you know, yes, you know, that's exactly the dog I wanted, perfect. But how in the world does he involve the posture? He, uh, I noticed something about him, kind of like what we noticed with like little kids and their movement quality and how good they are with, with their squat and stuff like that. Well, Jack, I noticed that that little guy is just so resilient. When we first, first were deciding on whether to take him home or not, he was sitting at, in the lake house of two stories. He was sitting like on the balcony, uh, just laying down. He was probably asleep. He was sleeping all day at that point. And I was out in the field and came back over. I noticed he was just flat on his back. Like he had literally just fallen from uh, the second story to the first story, concrete to concrete. And at first I freaked out. I'm like, oh my gosh, you know. Now, if you were really taking him home, we had to take him to the vet. The dog probably broke his back or something. but. He was perfectly fine. Got up, ran around, just like a little cat. Like, you know, uh, and it, it just kind of made me realize that, for whatever reason, you know, at, at such a young age, dogs, people, we, we do have so much more resiliency, right? I mean, we, we go through a lot of um, trauma, but that we can come back from. Or we can get away with some mishaps and things not looking so perfect uh, because you know, we're so much more adaptable at that age. And I think posture, as far as our bad habits that we accumulate as, as kids and adolescents as adults, uh, that applies because as coaches, we tend to think that we can get away with a lot more with the younger age, the, the youth, the high school. So we'll load them up in the squat rack. We'll put as much weight as we can on them, uh, even though it doesn't look pretty. And we'll churn it out because we don't really see any symptoms right away. We don't really see the kid having low back pain right afterwards. You know, it, it's really not as common to see at that age, 14, 15, 16. Uh, but when I get them, uh, freshmen in, in college, they've got problems. Maybe some of them not so much, but at least for sure by the time they're 20, 21, senior year, they're just falling apart. And uh, I don't think a lot of that has to do with necessarily the sport, blaming the sport entirely. I think a lot of it has to do with the training, just us thinking that we can get away with training these kids with whatever means necessary to produce the results just because we're not seeing symptoms right away. Does that make sense? Um, so be mindful that although you're not seeing uh, anguish on, the, on their face at that moment or anything like that, that doesn't mean it's okay. That doesn't mean it's good. You still may be contributing to some bad movement patterns and, and ultimately some stress that the body doesn't need. Okay, moving on. Let's get into this little thing here. Uh, I kind of put up a spectrum to kind of put things in perspective. Uh, and as you maybe have realized by now, this is going to be more of just a comprehensive, practical ap approach to movement, okay? Uh, We'll get into the nitty gritty stuff later and I think the speaker after me really gets into some exercises that you can do to implement it. For me, this is more like postural awareness. I just want to expose to you guys the importance and the buy-in for being more meticulous with your athletes. So if you walk away from this talk with anything in the next hour, 
hopefully I've sold you on just caring more about how things look and no, having some kind of comparison to uh, standardize that too. So on this spectrum, I think a lot of us think in, in the sports world, I say us as in, I'm speaking for the sports community also, um, that success comes at all costs, but sometimes, you know, more pain, more gain, we feel like we can only achieve that upper left side if we're on the bottom right side. Like giving it your all, being injured, being in pain. If you've got that, then that means you've given it all. You've sacrificed everything for success. Now, ideally, that wouldn't be the case. Ideally, we would have success and healthy, a healthy body to show for it. Uh, and that's kind of what this whole topic is about. I want us to, to think of training as not only a means of, of producing the result, which every coach wants to win, uh, but also making sure that it's, it's in the best and most efficient way possible as far as keeping the athlete healthy. I don't know where to point this thing. So we're going to review some key concepts real quick to get all get on the same page. Uh, the first thing I'll start out on is just biomechanics. Um, what do we know about habits? Habitual physiology, habit, how are habits formed? Well, they take reps, you know, consistent reps, doing something over and over and over again, right? Uh, why do we have habits? Why do we even have the ability to form them? They preserve cognitive energy. I don't have to think about how to retie my shoes again step by step. I've already learned that as a habit, and I'm saving, saving the juice upstairs for, for other activities. I can just, you know, tie my shoe without having to worry about much of anything, right? Um, daily activities contribute to our habits. We've got good habits, we've got bad habits. Uh, the point being there is a lot of postural uh, issues, concerns, good things, bad, th bad things come from just habitual tendencies. Just, uh, I've always hit this way, I've always squatted this way, I've always walked this way, whichever. That tends to be the culprit, you know, and, and we gotta learn, okay, which are the good habits, which are the bad ones, how can we reshape those? And as everybody in here knows, Changing a habit is not easy. How many of you bite your nails? Okay, no one wants to admit it. I'll admit it, I bite my nails. Uh, bite, bite my nails and for whatever reason, I don't know, it's been like since second grade. Maybe it's some traumatic experience that had, that had happened, but my wife hates it, being a nurse, a germaphobe. It just freaks her out all the time and I, and I try to stop and it's just so hard. And I know the necessary steps to, to nip that in the bud, but it's just, uh, difficult for me. So we can all relate to some bad habit as it being difficult to break, right? And then of course uh, uh, we have subconscious biomechanical uh, movement patterns that we don't even really think about. And one of these which is really trying uh, really revealing itself in the movement world now uh, is just the agonist antagonist relationship. While we have one prime mover that should be the agonist that should be doing all the work, uh, it ends up being neutralized just because of, we've had some bad tendency and bad pattern uh, for so long. And so what we're seeing is uh, a subconscious neutralization or overactivation of a certain muscle because of just the way we've been sitting all day or just, you know, and the way that our daily activity has represented itself. Um, uh, so from conscious to subconscious, uh, we want to take my, my, my point in saying that is we want to restructure our habits and say this is what I should be doing. I should be moving this way, squatting this way. I'm exposing it and making it conscious now. I'm practicing it over and over again so that it in turn will become subconscious. Does that make sense? So we're, we're making something that this is the way it should be, which we'll learn today. How can I now just make that like my daily life and I won't have to worry about it again? Making that subconscious. And ultimately, huge influence on not only performance, um, but the health of the athlete also. Uh, I think I'm gonna probably have to, is there a play button on here? Maybe not. I'm gonna click on this, this is a little video I have of one of my 170 pound athletes uh, pulling a 500 pound deadlift, which uh, it always gets the mojo going in the weight room when somebody pulls a good, a good lift. Um, I'll go and show you the video first and we'll talk about it. No sound, but that's okay. A little shaking, pulling all the way up, full extension, he gets it. All his buddies are pumped. You know, he, he gets it done, right? Now, his deadlifts have looked much worse than that, but obviously it was a struggle, right? Like, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't easy. It's still really exciting. Like, I, I love to see that he's pulling, you know, two and a half times his body weight. That's, that's pretty awesome. He's a strong dude. But 
you know, with athletes and with coaches and myself, we have such a task-oriented mentality. It's all about, I gotta take that weight and lift it up, or I've got to uh, produce the results in the field, I've gotta score this goal by whatever means necessary. It is devoted to the task, right? Can we all agree on that? Coaches, athletes, it is the, you, you tell me what to do, coach, and I will do it, I will get it done. I love the athletes like that, by the way, because not, not all athletes are like that, and uh, I definitely appreciate those that are, are very dedicated to the, to the result. However, this can get in the way when you're trying to preach, okay, you know, task is important, absolutely, but what about the process? What about how to get there? And so, you know, my recommendation here, too, would be, as a coach, coach the task and how to get to it, but educate the process. Show them the most fundamental, efficient, effective means to achieve that task, okay? And that's where we're gonna have to be more involved. That's where we're gonna have to really take time to, to talk about things and explain things and rationalize things and, and understand how things work. Uh, but I promise you it's worth your investment. If you can teach athletes to understand the best way to achieve the process, that's great. But this kind of also kind of goes with the, the conscious to subconscious thing. Some athletes, you know, they don't, they don't want to care about the process. They just want to do what it takes to, uh, to achieve the goal. And you may not ever change them to that. And that's okay. Um, but you can find, find ways to still correct their restrictions, correct their, their issues uh, in a creative means by making that task oriented. And then eventually it becomes subconscious for them where it just becomes natural. But uh, we can always make something task oriented by making it more competitive or making it more fun. Hey, uh, do these, uh, this yoga pose for however long you can do it for. And everybody's like, oh, and chirping at each other and trying to hold it. What did you just do? Well, you contributed to the process by increasing their posture, but we made it task oriented for them. Does that make sense? So uh, that's a big thing. But we, we need to understand the pros and, and cons behind this and how athletes are naturally. So here we have a uh, little quote that I threw up here. I got some of these mixed in. Uh, couple this task priority blindness with an overly simplified system of a pain's indicators, and it's easy to understand how athletes can dig themselves into some pretty deep holes. And uh, I, you know, I have a big influence from Dr. Kelly Sturette, K-Star is what they call him. He, he wrote uh, Becoming a Supple Leopard, which is a really good book, by the way, uh, dealing with posture. But you know, this, this quote makes a lot of sense to me in that we tend to dull the pain. You know, we, we, we ignore it. We say, oh, pain is just, uh, it's just a distraction. And so whatever it takes to get to the goal, we ignore a lot of those, a lot of the issues uh, with that. And pain you know, exists for a reason. Uh, it's not necessarily just a mental weakness, although in some instances it, we need to be able to, to treat, teach athletes to be mentally tough and to push through some kind of pain. But we're talking about different kinds of pain, right? Not like joint pain that shouldn't exist. That's not the kind of pain we're trying to get them to push through. Uh, we're, we're talking specifically about, um, you know, muscular fatigue and things like that. In regards to physical pain, one of my biggest pet peeves is when an athlete doesn't tell me that something hurts. You know, we're in the weight room and it looks good. They're doing some hand cleans or whatever. And then uh, I just hear maybe indirectly through another athlete or something and they're like, uh, or I can see it on their face. Like, I, I'm a pretty good pain detector. I think I am. I can, I can tell when somebody is, is hurting when they shouldn't be, and I call them out on it, and I'm just like, you know, trying to teach them, you shouldn't, this isn't normal, you shouldn't be feeling this. Uh, we have pain for a reason, because it signalizes a problem. Whether it's localized or systematic, you know, I'm not a clinician, so my scope of practice maybe tends to kind of stop there. I'll, I'll kind of like, uh, what do you call it, triage it a little bit. What's, well, you know, where's the source of the pain? What are you feeling? Uh, I didn't go to school to be able to understand a lot of that stuff, so I'll, I'll at least, from my, base, my, my personal experience, get an idea of what the problem is. But of course, I'm going to report to the athletic trainer or the, the PT, or whoever's responsible for the athlete's rehab or whatever. The bottom line is that that's, that's an issue that needs to be addressed. So uh, I would encourage all of you to be pain detectors as well. You know, know when an athlete is in any kind of abnormal or irregular pain that should not happen with like a basic squat, right? I mean, there are some things that they should just should not be in experiencing pain at all. Um, <clears throat> uh, in regards to just motor development, motor pattern learning, uh, introduction movement, 
how do we learn something? So you guys are all trying to teach your athlete to Olympic lift, or you're trying to teach your athlete to do a med ball, a toss, or anything, it doesn't matter. You know, it's an exercise that you know that is gonna benefit them, and what's the process? You either tell them what to do while they're doing it, you show them what it's like, this is how you do it, and they get it, they learn it, you demonstrate it, um, you show them the correct way, maybe you just like say, ah, you're not doing it right, so I'll show you uh, the correct way to do it. And then of course you have the reinforcement of that movement, basically like putting your seal on it. Like, okay, you got it now, you've got the movement down, it looks good, your range of motion solid, stability, blah, blah, blah. Now let's add some resistance to that. Let's really put a seal on it and make that adaptation process happen. Because as you guys know, uh, resistance and intensity is really what kind of programs that movement to be almost permanent and it gets it to be uh, subconscious, gets it to be enhanced. And it isn't until you uh, at least get the movement to where you want it that it is a good idea to start adding a lot of resistance and, and embedding that motor pattern. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like resistance would be like the hammer and the nail, like just really putting it down. Um, but for most of us, I think by now we understand if we're trying to teach somebody something for the first time and they're terrible at it, let's take resistance out of the picture. Let's just like body weight with a dowel, you know, just kind of get them to learn it at first, uh, make sure they do it right, and then we could start adding things like volume, intensity, and frequency, volume being uh, a lot of reps at one time. We kind of see that with our daily activities, doing something over and over and over again, maybe without realizing it. Intensity. Uh, whether it's resistance, whether it's tempo, slow going down, holding a position at the bottom, pause squats, as I heard uh, Greg talk about yesterday, uh, or frequency, doing it every day, every other day. However important it is to you and your program, these, these are means for uh, enhancing that pattern, right? And this, this isn't just weight room stuff. We're talking even sports skills, throwing a baseball, swinging a bat. Uh, this is kind of how we understand the process to work, right? The purpose of resistance training, this is weight training, one, resistance training one-on-one -on -one in one slide. So we have some basic principles here. We're trying to, to train these concepts or uh, performance variables, strength, power, endurance, flexibility, bioenergetics, hypertrophy as well. I don't know why I didn't throw that on there. Uh, motor year recruitment is big time. Of course, it's dependent on intensity, force, and rate of force, but that's really our, our primary goal in developing power and, and using resistance in the first place. So you're not going to recruit a whole lot of motor units if it's just a dowel. You know that you need to add a little bit of resistance to this movement to be able to really get the most out of the body you know, and really recruit a lot of those motor units. Um, progression, we know, okay, here they are now. Here's little Johnny squatting 100 pounds. Let's squat 105 next week, 110. You know, we understand that we should progress accordingly and not just some random workout of the day. We need to make sure it, it does follow a plan, a scheme. And then uh, Olympic weight training. Uh, because I know you guys, some of you are, are college level strength coaches, but because I know most of y'all don't really attend a lot of the college conferences. I was just at one in Utah last week, uh, or week before last week. What I, what I see just across the board, LSU, you know, Baylor, it doesn't matter. The, the biggest, most um, successful programs, strength conditioning wise, Almost every single one of them has one thing in common. You guess, guys guess what that is? Olympic weightlifting. Almost every single one of them uses Olympic weightlifting to some degree, okay? And I'll get on a little tangent about that later and we can talk more about it. This is an Olympic lifting presentation, but I'm, I'm absolutely sold on the benefits of Olympic weightlifting. Of course, they need to be manipulated in, in certain contexts with certain sports, not all sports. Uh, is it appropriate for things like that? But what you're gonna see is a parallel between everything we're talking about as far as enhancing someone's posture and progressing through Olympic weightlifting. The end result here with Olympic weightlifting is to produce something fast and explosive and with good technique. Posture, sports skill, it's the same thing. But Olympic lifting, where people really miss out on it, is all the progressions, all the steps necessary to get to that point. But it serves as such a good model if you're a good coach and you know how to coach through all that stuff, that carries right over to every sports skill or posture in any sense. So, but we'll get into a little bit of that, uh, maybe in discussion, questions afterwards or uh, towards the end. Okay, so a little bit of background with the concepts. Now we'll get into actually uh, the meat of the topic, right? So 
I love this definition. Uh, posture is a state of condition at any given time, at a given time, especially with respect to capability in particular circumstances. You know, this, this wasn't from the NCA Essentials Text. This is from Merriam-Webster's uh, dictionary, right? State of condition. So what does that mean to you guys? Really just whatever state I'm in, you know? I'm, I, you can say that I, there's a certain posture for this stance here, you know, for this stance. Posture is the integrity of a movement dependent on whatever pattern that it is that you're talking about, whatever pattern it is that you're trying to program. So when I ask you guys what is posture, probably the first thing that comes to your mind is, you know, book on the head, you know, standing upright. But, you know, what if I told you posture isn't just that? Posture is the integrity of every single thing that you do as far as what we understand good biomechanics to be. And so this is where I think, this is where the topic opens up to is that there is posture in regards to every movement. I mean, there, there, we need to understand there is a proper way to organize our body, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what um, the capability of the individual or whichever, there's always a good posture. This is uh, Coach Steve Moore. He is our tennis coach. He's won seven straight men's conference championships in the Southland Conference, and we just won our first uh, women's conference, and we got blown away by Baylor in the NCAAs, but that was kind of expected. But either way, he's got a lot of success. He actually used to coach here at A&M. Uh, he he's probably, probably my favorite coach to work with just because of how enthusiastic and animated he is. This, this isn't just some rare occurrence of him showing an athlete during a game. This happens throughout the entire game. He's getting in there and he's like, get low, you know, and set your core, and he's doing this. He's just so animated. The athletes just get so sick of it after a while. They're just like, coach, we get it. You know, I know I need to get lower. Uh, but he is such a big proponent of just good position uh, in regards to a good forehand or a good backhand or a good serve. And he, he's always got his coffee and his, and his hat, but uh, he, he will waste as much energy as possible or use as much energy as possible to get the point across of correcting good body position because he knows, understands how important that is for the sport. <clears throat> uh, this is from Dr. Spaniel, who's a biomechanist, biomechanist at our university. I was just having a discussion with him one day and kind of talking about my topic and, and kind of getting some feedback from some people. And then he says this, he says, there's an optim optimal way to do everything. And he's just like, huh, I'm gonna use that in my talk. You know, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna steal that from you, do you mind? And I, I like it because this is true, right? There is, there is an optimal way to do everything. There is a, uh, an efficient and a, an effective means to accomplish whatever movement pattern there is. Our goal is to find out what that is. What is the optimal way? Okay, that's why you guys come to conferences. What's the optimal nutrition? What's the optimal way to do a squat? What's the optimal way to increase mobility? Is it yoga? Is it, you know, whatever else? With regards to posture and body positioning, what is the optimal body position? This, we optimize, we're coaches, we're trying to find the best way to do everything. Why? Because it saves, en it saves energy, uh, it produces performance gains uh, to a greater degree, and you know, yes, I can deadlift like this, you know, and, and still complete the task and, and pull the weight from the bottom up and say, coach, I did it, but I, I know this is a more optimal way to do it, right? So that's kind of what I'm getting at here. So what is, uh, I have this little cool graph to kind of make this a visual aid for you guys. Um, what is optimal posture? It's a product of balance, mobility, and stability, each at their highest effectiveness and efficiency during any given motor pattern. Now, this is my definition. You can probably pick it apart and find some, okay, well, maybe it's more than just balance, mobility, and stability, um, you know, whichever, but this, this is how I see it. This is just what makes sense to me. And hopefully it just, at least my point gets across to you guys that it is a combination of things, okay? Uh, if, if I know that I'm in the optimal position to stabilize my core, which we'll go into great length of detail in the next presentation, um, balance is also important, just maintaining proprioception and, and, and not falling over, whichever, uh, and then also having the, the proper range of motion in the leg or whatever joint that I'm referring to. Excuse me. All these things contribute to the optimal posture, the optimal position, okay? So now we're kind of seeing it more from a macro level to a micro level. 
let's fix these things, or which one of these things is a weakness that may be a, de you know, a detriment to ultimately what should be uh, optimal body position, okay? Uh, I have a little illustration for you guys, but before you get distracted with that, um, I really like the analogy that K-Star, I'll just call him K-Star, Dr. Kelly Surrett uses, uh, which is that, obviously a flawed analogy, and you guys can probably see it, but he likes to think that our bodies from birth, we're born with a certain amount of movement cycles. Kind of the same way that cats are born with nine lives, we're born with uh, 100 million movement cycles. Okay, let's just say that. And with these movement cycles that I have from my day of birth till the day I die, I can do a movement pattern, I can uh, kick a ball and expend maybe one movement cycle, right? I've just used a movement cycle. So I've got 999 whatever million left. Okay, I just did, did it that way. Um, if I kick that ball with bad positioning and my plant leg is way off, I'm missing some internal external rotation in my hips, you know, I've got weakness in my back, and I end up kicking this ball and probably falling over on myself or just uh, expending way too much energy and stress kicking this ball in a way that I know is not the correct manner, I've maybe expended three to five movement cycles. So I, when, I, when I should be expending just one, I'm actually d having more degradation on my body, ultimately, for the same task. Does that make sense to you guys? When really I can optimize it in a way where if I just get everything working properly and I get my plant leg here and everything's good, I'm not missing any range of motion, I'll only expend one, but I'll still produce just as much power, if not more power. Maybe I I'm unlocking some things that have restricted me for so long that now I'll have more range of mo or more leverage to get that ball to go, to go further. Does that make sense to you guys? Um, so kind of, you know, again, it's a flawed analogy. You can think of some ways to, to pick that one apart. But at the end of the day, I think it, it brings things into perspective. Like, I know, you know, you have an athlete who's 18 years old, and already they've got back pain and knee pain. And you're like, I, I mean, maybe genetics play a role, but something tells me you've been doing something wrong for a long time. Like, you've been expending way too many movement cycles when you shouldn't have been. Uh, and pain would obviously be that that symptom of detecting that. So here's another analogy for you, and I think this will help guide a lot of what we're talking about uh, in regards to finances. Um, my wife is the bookkeeper at home, so I'm definitely no expert to be talking about finances. You know, when, whenever you get married, I guess there's this, this decision making of like, I guess you'll be responsible for that, I'll be responsible for this, and she looked at my life and said, I'll do the bookkeeping, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, I'll be responsible for the, for the saving of money and expending the money. You just, you tell me. I'm like, okay, yeah, you're the expert, which she is. But uh, I still, you know, understand enough about saving money and expending money and spending money I don't have uh, to kind of use this illustration, which is on the, on the left-hand side, we have our debit account, which we can afford to use. We can afford to do this movement, and we want to be pulling from this account, right? And we have symptoms and, and fatigue and things like that that tell us you're running out of money, you know, stop. Or you have pain and, and issues telling you that you should not be pulling from that account anymore, you're about to run out. Rest, restore, that account will be replenished. A lot of us though, with our athletes, are on the right-hand side of things and pulling from the credit account, which we've already pulled from the, you know, enough from the debt and now we're having to use money that we don't have. We're, we're, we're using resources that we're gonna have to pay for later and our body's being broken down, but we're doing it as a means to still carry out the task because it doesn't matter, you know, if, if I'm falling apart, I'm running this marathon. I am, I'm completing this thinking thing even though I didn't train for it and now I'm really pulling from my credit account. You know, I ran a half marathon once having only run twice. That's just a lack of discipline and laziness and it was miserable, you know, I still pulled it off, but. I was just like dead for like an entire week afterwards. Uh, obviously, I pulled from my credit account. Maybe you have some issues because of that, I don't know. Uh, but we, this illustration is trying to educate you guys and reveal to us that we need to be only pulling from the area of our body, the, the movement cycles and the patterns that we can afford to, to use. This is kind of a loaded definition. Uh, forgive me for just reading out the slide, but I think it's really good. And this is in regard to doing something poorly over and over and over again. Put, this is Andrew Johnson, he's a uh, triathlon expert. He's even got a documentary about a race that he ran and his story is really cool. 
a really interesting guy. Um, but pushing into ground results in the ground pushing back at you. Yet your body is not aligned properly. So just like when you fail to nail a hammer straight down and the nail bends, each misaligned step you take not only robs you of propulsive force, it also brings you that much closer to the breaking point. So not only are you losing power, but you know, every misaligned step, every time that you do a squat with excess extension, every time you do a squat with bad position, you're just bringing yourself that much closer to uh, the breaking point or hurting yourself or anything like that. Uh, age, depreciation of nervous system structures, soft tissues. These are a list of uh, other factors that influence posture, maybe beside our daily activities. Age is, as you get older, you depreciate naturally. That's something that we know affects our posture. Uh, training status, beginner elite, uh, advanced, breathing, how we breathe, training experiences. All these things at some point or another throughout our life will, will contribute to what our posture is today, right? Um, got a few more learn motor patterns, good versus bad, range of motion, joint restriction, strength injuries. All these things at some point will contribute to uh, the, either the good posture you have or the bad posture. A lot of these things are the areas that we need to focus on to make sure that we're optimizing our position. Okay, now the spine. So in order to understand what good posture is, we obviously need to spend a lot of time understanding where the spine should be, okay? The spine is absolutely critical. Uh, it's responsible for a majority of movements. Uh, this is a, a cool shot that we took in the weight room, some soccer girls doing uh, some broad jumps. Uh, we've got good extension there on the left and then landing mechanics on the right, uh, loading up. The spine is, is, is like a whip in this sense. It's just, you know, you've got this global extension and global flexion and all this manipulation that allows your body and limbs to move in a certain capacity to carry out a task. Uh, so quick review. What do we know about the spine? Well, that's how it should look. This is what we know is the neutral spine. Uh, you have a nice uh, lumbar, natural lumbar curve in the lumbar spine, which is why it's called that, uh, or lordotic curve in the lumbar spine. You have a little kyphosis in the T-spine, which is normal. Uh, this is the way the spine should look at rest and what we refer to as a neutral spine. Also look at the pelvis, look at the rib cage. The rib cage is neutralized and down here. The pelvis is right underneath uh, the lumbar spine. It's not out this way, rotated forward or rotated back. Everything is in the way God intended it. It's just lined up exactly how it should be, okay? But with regards to articulation, the spine can move in a lot of ways. It can flex, it can extend, lateral flexion, rotation. The pelvis can move back and forth. It's a natural thing but we still need to know what neutral spine looks like. We, regardless of all these articulations the body has uh, and how maybe some of those articulations can contribute to a good you know, pitching motion, whichever, understanding that is important. But in the weight room, probably the most significant posture that you all need to, to understand and, and have a descriptive um, analysis of and be able to evaluate is the neutral spine because what we know about the neutral spine is that it puts the body in the most anatomically stable position, okay? You can handle them, you can tolerate the most resistance and force in this setup, okay? Whether somebody's punching the stomach or you're about to deadlift or squat your max, this is the, the most stable position that you can be in, okay? Any deviation from that, whether it's just a little too much cervical extension or some pelvic tilt or some really crazy deviation like over roundness and all kinds of stuff, um, that is gonna put you in a less optimal position. It's a less stable position considering what you're about to do, okay? Now there are some movements that require a lot of articulation, a lot of rotation and sports skill. But the difference between those movements and the weight room is there's no weight with those movements, right? I mean, of course, there's a lot of force behind that and you don't wanna do something the wrong way. But in the weight room, you don't want to be anything less than in an optimal position stability-wise because you're dealing with a whole ton of resistance, a whole ton of weight, of course, assuming that they've followed all the patterns and whatnot, right? That they've progressed accordingly. Uh, this is one of my go-to IPAs, a little plug-in for Dale's Pale Ale. Uh, core muscles, again, the, the topic next is gonna cover a lot of this, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much, but up top, we got the diaphragm, abdominals, obliques on the sides, and paraspinals in the back, and the pelvic floor at the bottom. Okay, a lot of us spend 
maybe too much attention. You guys have heard, you know, the six pack, the crunching here. We're also not really spending enough on the deep uh, abdominal musculature uh, behind that, as well as the deep internal obliques and the paraspinals underneath. And the reason why it's a soda can, because, or I mean a beer can, is if you look at a beer can or a soda can, it's got equal pressure from all sides, right? It, it's not gonna give in on any other side more so than the other. That's what our core should be like. We should have equal stability and support from all around. So how do we accomplish that? We accomplish that by a little concept, uh, probably has been around for a long time, but uh, it's in the physical therapy world, this, this is something that's not revolutionary. I mean, they, they've, people have been, and the physical therapists have been working on good posture, and body position, and midline stability for years and years and years, but strength coaches have never really had access to the information. Maybe we have uh, publicly, but we had just never been told in an elementary sense to be able to understand it. And that's why I think Dr. Kelly Surrett's book, Becoming a Supple Leopard, is so good, because it's teaching us strength coaches, who I'm not the smartest person in the world, and I'm definitely not a physical therapist, and there's a reason for that, uh, but I understand at a baseline level, at least in the weight room, how to produce good stability and, and cue all the core muscles the same way a physical therapist would in a clinical setting, okay? Uh, and it is paramount with things like a snatch or Olympic weightlifting. His, he's got that, that neutral spine that we're, we're so much a proponent of. I mean, but how in the world is he able to keep that with that much weight above his head? Because as we all see on a daily basis, as soon as you maybe add weight to somebody, that neutral spine is gone, you know, it's broken. So what are some ways that we can encourage that? Uh, even just from like an organizational standpoint, not necessarily just yelling at them and cueing them, but kind of showing them how to set up their body. Um, so this is where I'm gonna have everybody stand up. Make you a little uncomfortable this morning, get you woken up. Hopefully no one too tall is in front of you. If that's the case, you can move around. Uh, pretty much the rest of the lecture, I'm gonna be more hands-on anyway. So. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and go through this bracing sequence right now, okay? But real quick, keep standing even though I'm talking. Uh, one of the biggest issues that you see uh, with coaching technique is that we are too narrow-minded. We're too single-minded when it comes to uh, the body position. For example, on the squat or, hey, we'll use the squat. On the squat, athletes here, and they're maybe too rounded. They're dumping the chest forward and they're, and they're squatting down and they're coming up and it just kind of looks bad, right? So as a coach, what's the first thing that you would tell that athlete? Chest up, head chest, up. chest up, head up, right? So here they are. Hey, uh, Johnny, uh, stick your chest up a little bit more and everything will be fine at that point. And they're, okay, so they stick the chest up and maybe that kind of cues that tonic reflex they learned as a baby and now they're here and now they've got this squat that has put their entire body into an overextended position because of just that one cue that you gave them. Because yes, it's just chest up, but you're not educating them on, on everything else, on where the body should be elsewhere, the pelvis, the, the rib cage, the core. So that one thing is actually not just one thing. That little manipulation of the chest has actually put them into global extension, which is, according to Dr. Ron Haruska, the Postural Rest Restoration Institute owner and arguably one of the biggest proponents of posture correction, says is, is the fundamentally worst thing you can do is squat or lift with over lumbar extension. He says that is just awful, and I agree. I've got a low back pain issue to show for that as well. Because I've always told my clients, uh, chest up, shoulders back and down. And you think that if you just say that, problem solved, right? I can do any exercise in the world as long as I tell them, scap, shoulder blades back and down, chest up, scapular downward rotation, whatever, fixed. Now go do some rows and you're, you're fine. It couldn't be further from the truth. So what we're gonna look at right, right now is a sequence that instead of like top-down approach, from here, we're gonna look at the bottom-up approach. Okay, so we're gonna start actually with the glutes. So step number one. Uh, maybe y'all have heard this, the pelvis is like a bowl of cereal. Uh, you don't wanna tip it too far forward or too far backward as far as just neutral spine is concerned. It needs to be right underneath your lumbar spine. So we don't want any dumping forward or backwards. And I know all of us have done this motion before. So we kind of at least understand how that part of the body works. Uh, but the first thing we're gonna address is to neutralize that pelvis. So how do we get that pelvis to stay still? How do we get it to get where it's not dumping forward or back? Squeeze the glutes. So right now, everybody, shoulder width apart, standing right on top of your feet, just like you've been told since you were 
uh, lifting weights in the early days. First thing, I'm not telling you to squeeze the glutes as hard as you can, but more so like isometrically contract the glutes, okay? So I'm not, I'm not trying to tell you to go to mass, uh, maximal concentric contraction. It's more of an isometric contraction. Does that make sense? Because I don't want to see your hips go forward. It's not helping us. I want to see just those glutes turn on. I want to see those glutes squeeze. So I can't see your butts from here, but I'm assuming all of our glutes are on, okay? We're tight, that's step one. Pelvis ain't going nowhere, we're tight there. Step two, rib cage. Now this is interesting, this is where we see a lot of our natural posture positions being wrong. A lot of us, just in our daily lives, from maybe sitting too much or whatever, naturally we're too overextended already. So this is where rib cage lowering kind of brings in the context that just standing here, and I know I'm bad, like if you look at my shorts, my seam line, it's already like at an angle this way, just because my whole life I've just been in anterior pelvic tilt and lumbar extension. So I've actually had to consciously lower my rib cage uh, and to maintain a neutral position. But I'm gonna give you one quick cue to give your athletes and for yourself to, to make this happen without saying rib cage or anything like anatomical like that. And that cue is exhale. It's that simple. Exhale. So what I want you to do, glutes are engaged. Forcefully, though, through your mouth, nose, I don't care. We'll get to that later. I want you to forcefully let out all of the air in your lungs. What just happened? My rib cage went down. My deep abdominals just turned on. I know y'all can feel that. If I punch in the stomach right now, it'd be pretty firm, right? Deep abdominals are on. I just fixed one of the most fundamental issues in all of posture over lumbar extension just by telling you to exhale. Okay, we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, but now it's kind of an over bracing of that abdominal muscul musculature. Once I've lowered that, that rib cage, cue myself isometrically, turn all that on. That's on, obliques, all that is, feels firm. And then lastly, now, now this is when you tell the athlete, shoulders back and down. But I want y'all to feel this. I want y'all to feel glutes, rib cage, abs turned on, and now you having to stick your chest out and draw your rib cage, or draw your uh, shoulders down without your rib cage coming back up. Just try that, just try it. You actually will probably feel some restriction in your upper back because we're missing maybe some range of motion. We're missing maybe some range of motion to stay neutralized here and at the same time draw our shoulder blades back. And, and we're gonna do something that's really gonna expose that. So without poking anybody's eye out, I want everybody to Take both arms and just raise them overhead where you are now. Okay, let's go brace, brace sequence. So glutes tight, rib cage down, go ahead and exhale. And now I want you with those arms without removing that rib cage, you're bracing. Don't let the rib cage go anywhere. See how far back you can pull your arms. Okay, don't let that rib cage go anywhere. Keep it down, keep it tight. Some of you guys are like, oh my gosh. They say ideally you should be able to get, you know, past the ear. You should be able to get this far. Okay, this is where we're, we, you can put your arms down now. This is where we say, I'm missing oh, thoracic T-spine mobility, thoracic extension, tight lats, tight triceps. You know, I've, I've revealed that I, I can't even get into this position without a stable core. So what happens when you tell an athlete to military press when they, when they don't have a good range of motion? Arch back, rib cage is flared up, I'm military pressing, I'm hammering that nail into a bad position over and over again, putting way too much stress on this SI joint, lumbar extension, Again, Dr. Ron Haruska says that's like one of the worst things you could do. So unless somebody can prove to you, look coach, I can go rib cage down and get good T-spine uh, extension here, please let me, I'm ready to military press now. I can do it without having any problems. But how many of you have ever seen somebody military press with overextension? We see the people in uh, Gold's Gym all the time and the dumbbell, you know, uh, that little 90 degree seated dumbbell shoulder press and they, get all the way back here, and then now it's like a, a bench press, right? Really bad for the back. We'll talk a little bit about that again. You guys can go to have a seat. So neutral spine. You're going to get a lot of that in the next presentation. I'm already running out of time. Uh, but teach your athletes this, okay? I can't think of a sport that doesn't have some kind of ritualistic uh, setup with one of the sports skills. For example, every baseball player has... You know, they look at the, uh, the batting box or the circle, and they know exactly where they should be. They set their hips, you know, they do their little routine. Every athlete understands rituals. They understand 
free throws and how many dribbles or volleyball serve, how many steps do I got to take? Every, the athletes appreciate and understand rituals. Make this a ritual. Before, when I teach the deadlift, I'll, I'll show them ritualistically how to get to that bar, bar over the toes, you know. Uh, I have a little setup that I use, a little template I could show you guys another time. Hips back, uh, you know, draw the ribcage down, blah, 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 blah. I, I make it ritualistic for them, which they get tired of initially. They're like, oh, so many steps. And, but once you get that down, now it can become subconscious. And now they can walk up to that deadlift, pull a massive deadlift, and it'd be fine because it's hardwired within them. Okay, the same way that they can walk up to that batter's box and go to work. Make this ritualistic, although it can seem exhausting at first. Take them through this sequence in regards to anything heavy weight lifting in the weight room. Squat, bench, you'll find yourself applying this for almost every exercise that is static. You know, something like uh, Olympic lifting, that gets to be more dynamic where you actually lose this sequence because you're in global extension, but then you go back to flexion. Uh, that would be a greater progression. Regardless, start here. And this is why I'm spending so much time on this slide alone because it's so important. Yes? The torque thing, uh, what's your name? Jason, Jason's referring to uh, K-Star's uh, concept of torque in that to add additional stability to what we just talked about, midline stability, is to externally rotate our limbs into our bodies. It's like you're screwing two screws into something to keep it more stable. And I've found in my personal experience that that uh, does absolutely help, like with a push-up, for example, screwing those shoulder blades in and kind of, we tell our athletes this when we squat, hey, screw your feet into the ground. Essentially, you are telling them to cue external rotation, and yes, I do do that, um, but I maybe don't, I mean, he takes it to a very far level where he'll do every mobility drill necessary to make sure that they're maximally torqued out. Um, sometimes that can kind of get frustrating for athletes. Like, you know, I, I'll put emphasis on it, but I'm not gonna say, you're not torquing enough, and let's get those knees way out there. As long as it's still an optimal, uh, neutralized position, I'm happy with that. Uh, what does global and uh, flexion and extension look like statically? Atlas ball, you know, obviously this is not a neutral spine, right? If I'm picking up an atlas ball off the ground, I, I'm gonna have to compromise a little bit. I'm gonna have to get fully flexed and brace. The trick is that I am still braced. The trick is that I'm still maximally bracing all the right musculature, okay? Is this the healthiest thing you can do? You know, I don't know, maybe not. You're putting your body in a pretty extreme ranges of motion with a lot of resistance with your spine. But I'm bringing this up as a point that it is, uh, your spine should still be able to flex and extend. The key is that it should be harmonized. The key is that it should be harmonized. You should have good harmony between the pelvis all the way to the spine. If you're gonna extend, extend everything. You know, if you're gonna flex, flex everything, otherwise neutral spine. And there are some exceptions to that rule. Uh, but another example would be a volleyball attack, full extension as a drawback, full flexion to finish. I mean, you have just a lot of, your body's like a whip in that motion. Uh, and this is kind of what Olympic lifting looks like. If you really break down what a snatch looks like, you're taking your body to full extension and not necessarily full flexion, but you're getting under it and you are flexing and absorbing the spine is in good harmony there. Uh, symptoms of poor positioning. I'm not gonna really spend much time on this. You guys kinda know what to look for by now. A lot of this looks like what overtraining looks like. You know, when you see symptoms of overtraining, symptoms of poor posture, they tend to correlate. Uh, there's some postural pathology stuff out there. This is by the great Vladimir Yanda. He's, uh, known as like the master of rehab. Physical therapists would be aware of him, I'm sure. Uh, he's basically coined the term for bad posture uh, and two different, uh, different diagnoses, which would be upper cross syndrome or lower cross syndrome. You've got uh, these muscles on the top right that are facilitated, means they're turned on. The muscles on the bottom left are turned on. The top left and top right are neutralized and inhibited when it should actually be flipped. Uh, this is why we have overactive pec minors uh, weak lower traps and serratus muscles, uh, weak uh, paraspinals, things like that. It's probably the bigger one that you guys can relate to is my hip flexors are tight. You know, everybody, oh man, my hip flexors are tight. It's because they're just turned on too often. They're always on, they're always working. It's not necessarily a tightness, it's, a, it's actually 
nothing you can do foam rolling may not be able to fix that because it's deeper than that. It's more than a muscular issue as a nervous system issue. We gotta cue the right muscles because your poor hip flexor don't know any better. They're, they're being cued when they don't need to be. It's probably because those glutes are just uh, inhibited. So I'm gonna breeze through the rest of this pretty quickly. Uh, low back pain, and I experienced this myself uh, because of just poor positioning and telling myself just from the top down that I'm okay and now I've got lumbar extension. Um, a lot of research and, and data to support that low back pain is contributed to uh, excess lumbar extension or just poor position in the weight room, okay? Breathing, again, I'm already running out of time, but uh, I think hopefully you guys will hear a lot of this later on. Just be aware of it. Be aware of breathing through the diaphragm, the way that we were originally intended to, uh, especially in a resting position, breathing out this way. You shouldn't have to elevate all your, your shoulder blades and everything else to, uh, to inhale. Try and inhale actually through this, through your diaphragm, through your abs, and exhale the same way. And that exhale, that's huge. I love to tell my athletes to exhale because just as how I thought that this fixed everything, telling my athlete to deeply exhale truly does fix everything. It neutralizes their spine. You completely exhale and draw down, you're gonna be a rock, you're gonna be tight. Of course, you gotta cue all the right things. Um, so diaphragmatic breathing is what this is referred to as, helps support that. Um, breathe through that. Why do we have poor breathing patterns? Public education, no. <laughs> but, you know, essentially, sitting down in a chair eight hours a day your whole life can contribute to some bad motor patterns, right? Recess is like 20 minutes and then everything else is however long. Yes? But considering most athletes um, for a rep will take a really deep inhale, how do you, when you're working with mm -hmm. a, a group, let's say, how do you cue that proper bracing sequence, knowing that what they're going to do before a rep is, is take generally a force mm -hmm. inhale that's going to expand breathing? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, your body's still can deeply inhale in this position with it being okay. Uh, just in regard, however, to like daily activities is what I'm referring to, the breathing should come from you know, the diaphragm. And I, breathing is such a mental thing too and like preparation, like oh, deep inhale, deep exhale. I feel like that's okay. Just make sure that still before they lift, before the load is bared on them to exhale and neutralize that spine. So that would be the kicker. Uh, as long as it's not that inhale remains an inhale. Does that make sense? And inhale, and now I'm military pressing, still have them draw down, go through the sequence, and, and hold that position. Uh, and then throughout the, all the reps and set, all the reps of that set, still have them maintain that, that neutral stability with that core, that midline. Uh, restrictions, uh, mobility, stability. This is where, <laughs> this is where, uh, and I'll, I'll pretty much end here, but this is where on the left-hand side, I'll, I'll step back a, further, uh, a bit further. When you see an athlete who has a problem with something, their squat looks terrible, right? You walk in the weight room, you're trying to teach a squat, and it just does not look good. It's either one of two things, one of two categories. It's either a mobility issue or a motor control issue. They either just don't have the flexibility to do what you're asking them to do. I mean, how many of you all have taught a front squat before? How many of y'all have been unsuccessful with a particular athlete who can't get to a front rack? Okay, happens all the time. This posture, you know, tight lats, things like that. We need, no matter how hard you coach that athlete, dude, get your elbows up, elbows up, elbows up, elbows up. They're like, coach, I'm trying my hardest. They're not gonna be able to do it because they have a restriction, okay? So address that first, but maybe they just don't get it. Maybe they just don't understand they're not cueing the right muscles. That would be the right side of things you need to have a better discernment of knowing which is which. Is it a mobility issue or is it a stability issue? And take the necessary uh, steps to fix that. Uh, and I don't have a lot of time to go over, all, I don't have any time to go over any of these things. Feel free to talk to me after and I will show you um, some books and some references because you can have a whole lecture just on increasing mobility. You can have a whole lecture just on implementing stability. Um, but you guys, I'll, I'll email you this PowerPoint and whatever we don't finish, um, I'll at least reference you to uh, things later on. I kind of had intended to, to do some deadlifts and take you guys to some proper form of just some common issues that we see with it uh, and taking all through that. Uh, I love pictures of babies doing exercises because they do it well, naturally. Uh, squat was one. Uh, Push-up is another. I'm running out of time here. Push-up. 
common faults of that. Practical application. The thing that I, I, I want to end on, guys, and I clearly did terrible on my timing today. <laughs> Way too many slides. Um, but I think, I think my point was made. Um, and this is where I wanted to finish. Your program, I heard this quote a week and a half ago, your program is the product of what you emphasize and what you tolerate. I'll say it again. Your program is a, is a product of what you emphasize and what you tolerate. If you tolerate a poor squatting pattern, don't be upset at the results, okay? You're gonna get a bad squatting pattern because you've allowed it to happen. So be a little bit of a control freak in the weight room. Be meticulous about things. Uh, and whenever you know what it is that you're supposed to be doing and you understand the perfect position for that movement, coach the crap out of it. Emphasize it, emphasize it, emphasize it. Your athletes will uh, abide by whatever it is that you emphasize. And then, of course, don't tolerate the bad stuff. Um, phone number, if you guys just want to reach out to me, I I'm a big proponent of education. I teach as an adjunct faculty also at the university, and uh, I teach this stuff all the time. Um, I've, I'm interested in research, because I, I have a good relationship with the Kines department too, so uh, feel free to connect with me afterwards, and uh, I'd love to get to know you guys a little better. Thank you.